Hello students, this is Fazan Mirza. We are discussing infectious diseases now. Infectious diseases, when we classify disease, we need to understand what a disease actually is. So a disease is basically an illness or a disorder of the body or mind that leads to poor health. Each disease, each disorder, each illness is associated with a set of signs and symptoms. So there are signs and symptoms which are the clinical features of a certain disease. And these signs and features symptoms, how do they differ? What's the difference between signs and symptoms? Signs are the observable features of a disease and symptoms are the subjective feelings that a person can report to the medical practitioner or to the family or friends. And these subjective feelings cannot be judged or observed as a clinical feature, but the symptoms being reported by a patient or by a person are his or her own feelings. And these are very much important for appropriate diagnosis and its treatment of the disease. For example, the features such as skin rash or a wound or bleeding or swelling or, or you can say fever. They are all, they are all the uh, observable features. These are the signs of disease and, and for example, nausea or pain, but pain scales can be used though. Nausea and convulsions, and if a person says that I'm having, uh, I'm having uh, some kind of headache. So uh, for uh, up till now, up till now we see that these are these, these are symptoms and these are subjective feelings and there's no way of knowing this, but pain uh, soon, probably some years from now, pain will not be a symptom, it will become a sign because there is a lot of research going on to, to just convert some kind of electrical signals or come up with some signals which can which can uh, be recorded on screen and you can actually see that the person is actually in pain but for now for now it's give yeah pain for now is a symptom so we, we refer to we refer to uh, the terms and diseases endemic epidemic and pandemic so endemic endemic is the disease which is always present in a certain population at a certain time Epidemic when there is a sudden rise in a in a specific area of a certain for a certain disease. Pandemic pandemic is when an epidemic spreads widely throughout a country and the continent and then throughout the world. So I think with the COVID in uh, in place re, uh, right now, the so pandemic I don't think so. It's a very difficult term to understand. It began as an epidemic in China and then it just turned into a pandemic within a span of three or four months. So, a disease, how to classify a disease? There are various ways in which disease can be classified. The one that we are discussing here is classing by into it into just two main or broad classes, infectious disease or non-infectious disease. An infectious disease is due to it is a disease caused by, caused by a disease causing agent, a pathogen, and that pathogen is a, typically a microorganism which passes between organisms directly or indirectly. Bacterial diseases such as cholera, tuberculosis, viral diseases such as AIDS, smallpox, measles, fungal diseases such as its leaf foot, or protoctesian diseases such as malaria. So all these are the infectious diseases because there is always a pathogen involved in the, uh, you can say, the, the disease development. A non-infectious disease is not caused by a pathogen. It is not caught from another individual. It is mainly because of unhealthy lifestyle or poor genetics or, or some environmental condition. For example, cardiovascular diseases, malnutrition, genetic disorders, respiratory disease, for example, emphysema and um, cancer yes uh, and uh, uh, so cancer and uh, allergies all these can be all these can be classified as non infectious diseases so uh, the diseases that we are to discuss an infectious disease as i already discussed already discussed as caused by a pathogen that can transfer from one host organism to another so yes again take an example so the the, the, the initial host of covid according to the reports that have, that have surfaced so far so the initial host was bat and it was living it was this virus was there in bats forever and probably for a very long time nobody knew and then because of consumption of those bats up to up, up uh, i'm just following the reports that have surfaced so far and they they may change over the years though so it moved on from the host to another host and the host the next host became or the, the humans became the next host and when the virus found the, the next host it found it it found its way into the into our bodies and it is just uh, having its own cloud nine it's having a party right now 
So pathogen, pathogen is a biological agent, a virus, a bacterium, or a fungus, or a productus that cause a disease. A pathogen causing human disease will have as a part of its structure proteins that are different from those of human host and that they are regarded as antigens. And you can recall antigens we have discussed in cell membrane that antigens are cell surface markers. So the moment a pathogen enters your body, your white cells have the ability to recognize the foreign antigens as a non-self antigen because they have seen this antigen for the first time. But if you have been infected with the same pathogen before and this is the second time it's coming in, you will already have memory cells and you will not get the disease of the same intensity. Or even if you are vaccinated against that disease, then your, your white blood cells have a memory of that antigen. So when they encounter that antigen, the disease will not uh, set in. Uh, more on this later though. Uh, in another chapter. So diseases that we have to discuss here are cholera, malaria, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, measles, or smallpox, all the way eradicated. Causative agents are mentioned and the type of organisms are mentioned here. What need to be kept in mind that the colors that I've used here, purple, dot for, for bacteria, so the disease tuberculosis and cholera are of bacterial origin, vibrio cholera and mycobacterium tuberculosis and ambovis respectively. Uh, this orange dot is for viral disease, so measles and smallpox, and HIV AIDS by, is by virus, so this is a smallpox by variola virus, measles is by a marbly virus, and HIV AIDS by human immunodeficiency virus. Protoctus disease, this is this blue dot. This is malaria is a protoctus disease caused by four species of plasmodium, which we'll discuss uh, later in the same chapter. So when we are discussing, uh, when we are discussing a certain disease, we, we discuss the terms of carriers and how the disease can be transmitted. There are people who are carriers of the disease. They might not be suffering. They might not be uh, symptomatic at that time. They might be asymptomatic carrier. Asymptomatic carrier means they are not showing any signs. They are not having any subjective feelings that they really don't know that they are they are uh, they are harboring that particular particular pathogen in their bodies and it is these asymptomatic carriers that they just transmit the uh, pathogen to people around them as is the asymptomatic carrier would not know that he or she is a carrier of a pathogen so they would be least bothered if the pathogen is there since they would not know it to begin with so they would pass it on to the people around them and if a person is a carrier and the person knows that okay i am a carrier so the person would be a bit um, Cautious. Should be, ethically though. Okay. And then comes the transmission cycle. Transmission cycle just means that how a pathogen passes from one uh, host or one organism to another organism. And transmission cycle is the most important thing in, in, um, in controlling the outbreak of a disease or bringing the number of cases down. Because it's during the transmission cycle, it's during the transmission of from one host to another host, from one person to another, that the pathogen is most vulnerable if you break the transmission cycle by removing the conditions that spread the favor of the pathogen, you break the transmission cycle and you control the disease. For example, we are using masks and SOPs and everything during this COVID session. So we know that, okay, what are we doing? We are breaking the transmission cycle. For example, if we just we just ignore these SOPs and the mask and everything and a sanitizer and our hand washing and all the protocol that are that are being said that we are asked by WHO. So what we do, we would just favor the pathogen. We would not be breaking the transmission cycle. And the spread of the disease would be very quick as it was initially in China or in Italy or in regions where these things were not enforced. So yeah, transmission cycle breaking malaria, for example, you break the transmission cycle of malaria by, by making sure that the mosquitoes do not really breed. You remove the breeding areas of mosquitoes. So you remove the mosquitoes from that area. So if the mosquitoes are not there, you have broken the transmission cycle. So yeah, transmission cycle is the most important feature of an infectious disease in controlling a, the controlling uh, its outbreak. Mortality rates is, is a measure of the frequency of the occurrence of death in a defined population during the spread of uh, in a particular time. So yes, this is a very important term when, you are, when we are discussing diseases or infectious diseases, how likely is it the person can get sick from a certain disease and not just sick, the person can die from a disease. So yeah, that's very significant. So you can just recall, you can just discuss in among yourself what relevance do you think the infectious disease would have for the mortality rate, what's the importance of the transmission cycle and outline the importance of breaking the transmission cycle and preventing the spread of infection, which I have covered here. For example, you can see this, these are two cases. So these, these are black individuals. No, not black as in the, I've just, just used the color black here. So these black people here, they are the normal individuals. And this red one, 
I'll let you know who is he or she is. So yeah, these black ones again, these are the two cases. So you see that this individual red is the one who is suffering from an infectious disease at the moment. These ones, these black ones are the normal ones who are least concerned and they are not even, they, are, they don't really even know that this person among them is, is a person who is suffering from this disease or a carrier of the disease. And then there are these blue people who are those blue, 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 blue people. These are the carriers of the infectious disease in region A and region B. So just discuss it among yourself and do some brainstorming. What do you think? Predict the likely outcome of case A. This is the case A and the case B. That what would be the likely outcome of this arrangement? Like uh, how these are, how these people are spread out in this situation, and how they are spread out in this situation, and this this applies to the COVID situation as well. So these are the normal people who are not suffering. This is the individual suffering, and these are the asymptomatic carriers. So what will happen sometimes? So just uh, uh, do some brainstorming here, and probably you can <laughs> get us get an insight over what's what's what I am trying to say. So prevalence and incidence are the two terms they need to discuss. Prevalence means counting existing disease diagnoses. This is usually at a single point in time, which shows how prevalent the disease is. This is the this is the term which is used as an uh, is used in correlation with endemic. For example, you will always have cases of malaria in uh, malaria in Africa. So malaria is very prevalent in in um, in Africa. Similarly, tuberculosis is highly prevalent in Pakistan and right now COVID is extremely prevalent in European countries and America and uh, in, in, in England. Incidence discounts a new disease diagnosis during a defined period of time. How many new cases are, are coming across uh, for, for that particular disease in a defined time? So just what you can do, you can go for a group discussion and use internet for this. Make a list of infectious diseases in Pakistan currently that have high, high uh, prevalence and a high incidence. And probably you can get some uh, good information from you. The disease that we have to start is cholera. Cholera, the basically we'll be discussing epidemiology first. So cholera, uh, it, 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 it is documented since 1817. Since then, seven cholera pandemics have occurred. I don't think we need to really discuss what pandemic is. You know this very well by now. First six occurred from this, this point. You can say 1817 to 1920s. There's a very short span of time. They were all caused by Vibrio cholerae, the classical biotype which was prevalent at that time. All these pandemics, they originated in Asia with subsequent spread to other continents. And then the seventh pandemic, it began in, in Indonesia in 1961, affected more countries and continents and previous than the previous six pandemics. And it was caused by Vibrio cholerae Eltor. Eltor was the strain. It was a Vibrio cholerae, but a different strain. So the strain had mutated. So this was a new strain. It was more dangerous and it affected more people. So yeah, uh, this was a seventh pandemic. So yeah, seven pandemics of uh, of this particular cholera have occurred so far. So what's happening in cholera? This is the this is the causative agent of cholera, Vibrio cholerae. This bacteria, this is a bacteria, and you can see that the bacteria is having a tail. This is a flagellum, and because it's having a flagellum. This is a motile bacteria. It can swim. It's a bacteria since it is a bacteria, so it's a prokaryotic disease. the The basic, uh, the basic, uh, the fact regarding the pathogen is a Vibrio cholera. Mode of transmission is uh, is basically food borne and water borne and borne. This is not barn. This is born. So yeah. Uh, global distribution is Asia, Africa, and Latin America. You can see these are the these are the developing nations or less developed nations, not in somewhere in Europe or America or Australia, New Zealand, Canada, for example. Um, and then the global distribution, you can just just check this out. And then incubation period is about as about two hour, two hours to five days. And the site of action of pathogen is the small intestine. Severe diarrhea occurs. We call it rice water. And this rice water because the diarrhea is so extensive that the feces that are passed out are so watery that the term of rice water diarrhea is used. There's an extensive loss of water and salts, and dehydration follows and weakness. If these salts and water is not rehydrated. If the person is not rehydrated, this can be fatal. Diagnosis is normally because of rice water. This is a very clear indication. And then the microscopical, anal microscopical analysis of feces can actually show that, yes, it is the, this, was, this is actually cholera. How is it transmitted? So mode of transmission is actually kind of interesting that it is food and water borne. And there's a large number of bacteria uh, present 
and uh, in in the sewers, for example, a person who's already suffering from the from this disease would pass on the large number of these pathogens, these swimming ability while the bacteria into 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 sewers. So patients pass out these out in feces, and they go to the sewerage, and they when they go to the sewerage, they contaminate the underground uh, water supplies. So why? Because yes, in underdeveloped countries or developing nations, the water supplies which are underground they might be very close to sewers, which is a bad idea which is not very common in, in developed countries. But yes, in, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, this is the reality. So yeah, water supply is contaminated. If the water supply is contaminated by the sewer, which actually is having the feces of the person who passed out these bacteria, they, they gain access to water. And then the water, which is the tap water, if you use it in cooking or portable water, which you use in drinking, oh, you can just imagine what's going to happen. So contaminated water, this water contaminated, it is used in cooking and drinking, okay, and then it passes on to the food and the person is suffering from cholera. And the person would again, this person would pass out the feces and again, the same cycle will keep on repeating. So there's a transmission cycle. What do you need to do? You need to break the transmission cycle somehow by making sure that the sewage and the water supply do not contaminate or use use uh, water uh, for drinking and cooking purpose, which is which is properly, properly clean and it's not contaminated in any way. So that's that's the way that it can be actually taken care of. Uh, how cholera affects, this is the intestine, this diagram shows you how cholera affects the person. So this is the intestine, this is the connective tissue and the blood supply of an intestine. These are the cells of the intestine. So what actually happens, the cholera agent, when the cholera agent is there, the cholera, vibrio cholera, it grows and reproduces in the hum lumen of the gut because this is exactly where the food will come. And while reproducing, this vibrio cholera will produce an enterotoxin. And this enterotoxin is called as cholerogen. This cholerogen enterotoxin is a two protein complex. This can attach to the cell here, which is a vomit receptor. It triggers the vomiting in your nervous system. So vomiting occurs and the same, the same toxin, it attaches to the cells here. When it atta attaches to the cells here, what the problem it causes? The main problem it causes is that your cell, they start to lose chloride ions and they start to lose sodium ions and when sodium and chloride accumulate in the lumen of the gut a lot of water starts to flow out of here and this is simple osmosis happening so sodium and chloride ion being being accumulated here uh, this lowers the water potential you can use the term there probably so, so this water just is pulled out from from the cells the cells they become dehydrated they are in turn uh, pulling water from the blood supply so you the person starts to become dehydrated this salt and water and the uh, sodium and chloride they all pass out in rice water diarrhea there's an extensive loss of glucose so till the cholerogen then this thing is cleared off the person will keep on passing rice water diarrhea so how do you treat the you treat this with the antibiotics oral dehydration therapy is recommended which is ORS or ORT and uh, actually this is this is just a home remedy but then the person must be rushed to the hospital and IV drip of saline or dextrose saline is the only treatment that will assist the rehydration of a person together with the, the, the high doses of antibiotics so this is again something that I've already discussed uh, how this is uh, this uh, the uh, how this table actually works for the disease parameters and the features. So you can see this person is just drinking water and this water was just contaminated. So this is not this is this water was not supposed to be like uh, it was not supposed to be consumed in this way. But but this guy did poor person. So I think we know what's going to happen next. So this is this is the status of cholera in India. And uh, you can see these regions in India, which are endemic states. So these states, these are endemic. It's endemic. So it means that cholera is always present in this area and this area and this area and this area and here, 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 here and here as well. And non-endemic states. There are non-endemic states as well. So within India, there are states which are having, uh, which have broken the transmission cycle successfully. But again, there are regions, a large part of India, where this and these states. The, this is this is these regions. They show to you that okay, cholera is is uh, is a um, uh, disease of concern in in India and not India, in just in India, in Bangladesh mainly, and uh, in mainly mainly in the Asian countries and the African countries and the Latin America where the chances of the sewers contaminating underground water supply are high.
Another thing that to which need which can need to be kept in mind is that since this is the transmission cycle, it involves how the sewers they can get they can enter how the sewage water can contaminate water supply. So when when we, when uh, when an area uh, when an area undergoes landsliding or some natural calamity, for example earthquake the these these underground water pipes of uh, water supply or sewers they can break and this can cause intermixing and because of the consumption of this water in that area so not just one or two or three like hundreds and hundreds of people then they would just start coming up they would uh, with with cholera because uh, if there was just two or three or a, a, a handful of people with cholera at the time when the earthquake came so because of that so or that natural calamity came so with that increased contamination of water you will have a high 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 a very high incidence of of cholera and the and the mortality rate would be very high if the medical remedies are not not taken there if the if the rehydration supplementation is not provided to the patients if antibiotic treatments are not given uh, since the pathogen keeps surviving in the in this gut so it's away from the blood supply whatever drug you give you will it will be in the blood supply so whatever antibiotic you give it must have the ability to just come in the blood and, uh, and, and from the from the gut it gets absorbed in the blood so so this is this is again uh, something not easy so if you inject an antibiotic it would be in blood supply so it should be have the ability to cross it if you are taking the oral antibiotics only then the antibiotic would reach the gut and it must not get absorbed or must not get degraded by the HCL and the liver and the enzymes of the liver and the pancreatic juice and all. So yes, uh, cold raw treatment with antibiotic is not something very, very easy. But yes, there are drugs that can be used. There are antibiotics that work to treat um, cholera. And in a person, why in a person, if a person becomes immune to cholera, uh, what happens? Uh, the antibodies will still be in blood. The antibodies cannot just like escape from blood and the connective tissue and then the cell and then come into the lumen and then attach here. No, that's not going to happen. So the antibodies, they stay here. Very limited excess of antibodies here. So yeah, the the person who, the person who's suffering from cholera must undergo the, the treatment from antibiotics and this uh, IV and drip from saline. Saline is a salt solution which the drip is made about. Dextrosaline is when the drip is having the uh, sodium chloride together with glucose. So that's it from my side regarding cholera and the introduction of the infectious diseases. Thank you.